Hey everybody, it's Mr. Hazel, and I'm here to talk to you today about Chapter 2, The Chemical Basis of Life. Uh, we're going to get started with Chapter 2, Module 1, which is Organisms are composed of elements in combinations called compounds. Now, we know all life on Earth is, you know, the focus of this course. The study of all life is biology, and we know that that's the study of living things, but this chapter focuses on the building blocks that make up those living things, the non-living um, atoms, the non-living elements, the non-living compounds, and the molecules that are also non-living that then make up living things. Okay, and it's these building blocks that make all life on Earth possible. Without these atoms, elements, molecules, and compounds, we would have no life here on Earth. So let's go ahead and move on. All right. Um, we know that all life on Earth is made of what we call matter. And matter, we say, is anything that takes up space. That means it has volume. And it also has mass. Okay. Matter is made of elements. And, of course, we like to try to classify these elements. So we've created this periodic table of the elements and we organize the elements according to various properties. Now what is an element? Well an element is any substance that can't be broken down any further and still retain its unique physical and chemical properties. So in other words I can have one atom of oxygen but if I break that down any further than just one atom of oxygen then it's no longer oxygen. It doesn't react the way oxygen does. It doesn't have the physical characteristics like boiling point, melting point, etc. that oxygen does. So elements are unique um, and if you go, you can't go smaller than the elemental level. Now you can join elements together into compounds and here's an example of one. Okay, I can take this sodium and I can join it with chlorine and I can make sodium chloride which is table salt. Um, one of the unique things about compounds though, is a lot of times they um, have different properties than the elements that make them up. For example, you see the sodium there is a silvery metal and it reacts very violently, very explosively with water. Now that would be bad for us because we're 75% water. If we were to try to ingest that, it would kill us. This is the other half of table salt. This is chlorine in its gaseous form. You can see it's kind of a yellowish green and it also would kill you. If I were to put you into a, re a room and release chlorine gas into that room, the chlorine gas would kill you. Okay, so you've got sodium that reacts explosively with water, you have chlorine gas that will kill you, and yet when we combine them together, we get sodium chloride. Okay, sodium chloride, or as we commonly refer to it, just table salt, is not deadly at all. Um, we put it on our food, it's in, you know, everything we eat, uh, too much of it actually, but sodium chloride we need. We need sodium chloride, we need salt in our diet as long as it's in moderation. So this is a great example of something that has properties that are totally different than the elements that make it up. Again, sodium chloride, okay, sodium bad, chlorine bad. Now let's talk about some biologically important atoms, molecules, and compounds. The four most important um, atoms, biologically speaking, are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And here's why. Carbon's in everything in our body, okay? You've probably heard the term before, carbon-based life form. All life on Earth, all life that we know, which is only life on Earth, of course, all life on Earth is based around carbon. It's in your sugars that you um, use for energy. It's in structural... Um, things in your body, in organelles, in tissues, in bones. Hydrogen and oxygen, I mean that should be obvious. You put those two together you form water. And then nitrogen is equally important. Nitrogen's in every single protein in your body and nitrogen's in your DNA in the nucleus of your cells. And nitrogen, nitrogen is in RNA which you use for protein synthesis. Okay, so together if you look at carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, it makes up 90% of excuse me, 96 percent of your body weight. If you weighed 100 pounds, 96 pounds of that weight would be made up of C, H, and O. All right? And we already know that water is about 75 to 85 percent of your cellular weight. You can remember some of the other ones by just remembering the sentence, I see Hopkins Cafe managed by mine cousin Clyde Moe. And that stands for iodine, 
carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, iron, magnesium, boron, manganese, copper, zinc, chlorine, and molybdenum. Now, those ones are the major elements or major molecules in your body. But trace elements are just as important. And a great example of a trace element is iron. Okay, Iron, it only makes up about 0.004% of your body weight. That's a very, very small amount. All right, that is um, four one thousandths of one percent. And yet without iron, you can't make the molecule hemoglobin. And without hemoglobin, you can't transport oxygen through the blood to the cells and to the tissues. So iron, even though it's only needed in small amounts, is very, very important. Another equally important one is iodine. Iodine, you can see here in the Morton iodized salt at the bottom, um, iodine is used to make hormones in the thyroid gland in the neck. And when the thyroid doesn't get an adequate supply of iodine, you can form what you see there in this lady's neck, which is called a goiter. Okay, And it's just an enlargement of the thyroid. Um, you don't really see that in the United States very often because we iodize our salt and we get adequate dietary iodine through that. But in underdeveloped parts of the world um, where they may not have access to iodized salt or they have um, poor diet or poor soil, you're going to see that a lot more commonly. All right, now, atomic structure. We know that the atom consists of three main subatomic particles, and those are protons, neutrons, and electrons. We know protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, and they're approximately the same size, while electrons orbit outside the nucleus and are about 2,000 times smaller. Protons. We know protons have a charge of plus one. They have a mass of what we call one atomic mass unit. And I just mentioned they're about the same size as a neutron. The number of protons in an atom, and this is very important, the number of protons in an atom um, give you the atom's atomic number. Okay, So if there are seven protons, the atomic number is seven. Um, and that's really important. You saw that in the chapter two reading study guide. And we use protons quite a bit in biology. We use them to make proton gradients to do work. We use them for all sorts of things, okay? So you'll see protons quite a bit as we get into photosynthesis and cellular respiration later on this semester. Um, protons, some other important things are you never, ever, ever want to change the number of protons in an atom because the number of protons is how we define what the atom is. In other words, if I say to you, hey, this atom has one proton, you say, oh, that's hydrogen. If I say, well, this one has two, you say, oh, that's helium, and three is lithium, and so on, and so on, and so on. So when we're manipulating the charge of an atom, you never mess with the number of protons. You always manipulate the number of electrons. If I want to make an atom more positive, I do that by taking away negative electrons. And the flip side of that is if I want to make an atom more negative, I do it by adding negative electrons. Now, neutrons. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus. They're about the same size as the protons, so one atomic mass unit. And when you change the number of neutrons in an atom, you create what's called an isotope. Okay? Some isotopes are very stable. They'll last for tens of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Others, though, are very, very unstable, and they decay. And when they decay, when that nucleus breaks down, they give off radiation. Okay, These are radioactive isotopes. And we can use these radioactive isotopes in medicine now. What we can do is we can give you a radioactive isotope. You can ingest it either orally or it can be given as an injection or any number of ways. And then we can track these radioactive isotopes as they move through your body. We can observe how the body uses them, where the body stores them, how they're metabolized, how they're broken down. We can observe any number of things, and it gives us some insight into how your body is using those isotopes. The reason we can do this is your body has no idea that it's using a radioactive isotope. It's gonna, it can't distinguish, it can't tell the difference. So it's gonna take up those radioactive isotopes and use them the exact same way that it would use a non-radioactive version of the atom. Okay, and then we've got scanners, and we can, like I said, we can track those radioactive isotopes as we um, monitor their movement through your body. Okay, one of the tools that we can use to do this with is something called a PET 
scanner, and that's PET. And what a PET scanner does is it looks for very, very metabolically active areas in your body. Um, areas where there's a lot of activity going on at the cellular level. It could be maybe a lot of cellular division. It could be a lot of cellular growth. It could be anything really. But these PET scanners look for areas of high metabolic activity. Okay, And you can see here in this image, uh, you can see the area of high metabolic activity kind of at the base of the neck or where the neck and the shoulder join together. This is actually a, a real PET scan of a person that has cancer of the tongue. And what you see there at the base of the neck are the lymph nodes where the cancer is invading. And remember, cancer is just cell division gone out of control. So that's, a, that's an area of high metabolic activity where those lymph cells are just dividing and dividing, or the cancerous cells are dividing and dividing and dividing just out of control. Okay, here you see another image of a PET scanner and you can see a patient on there getting um, ready to enter the, the cylinder. Okay, and like we've already mentioned, you know, that PET scanner is going to create a three-dimensional image. Um, and it's going to allow us to diagnose, you know, potential problems without having to do something invasive like surgery. Another great use that we've just figured out we can um, use the PET scanner for is we can diagnose Alzheimer's very early on, which allows us to start treatment much earlier. Now, Radioactive isotopes are good in their proper measure, but overexposure to radiation obviously is bad. And you don't need to be in biology to know that. If you've seen any movie, you know that radiation exposure can be bad, can be dangerous, can be just not good for you, okay? Um, radiation can do a lot of things. First of all, radiation can damage your DNA, which means then that you're not going to properly make proteins. It means that you... Um, could have certain types of cancer, all sorts of bad things. Radiation can damage chemical bonds in your body. Radiation can break chemical bonds in your body. So in other words, if you've got a large complex molecule that does a specific job in a cell and it's exposed to radiation, the radiation can break that molecule down into two or three or more smaller fragments and now that molecule can't do its job. Okay. Um, equally as dangerous, radiation can cause bonds to form where there weren't bonds before. And that's just as bad because, again, we'll talk about through the course of this year, form determines function. So as a molecule um, has a specific shape or form, it has that shape or form to do a specific job. And if it doesn't have the correct form, it can't do its correct job. Okay, a uh, thing I'll close with here is you see an image of the nuclear plant outside the city of Chernobyl in the Ukraine uh, in 1986. This nuclear power plant um, had a meltdown. And what happened was the reactor vessel ruptured and it leaked radiation across the countryside for up to a year. And we've observed, you know, very high incidences of thyroid and other types of cancer in the Ukraine ever since then. So it's been a terrible tragedy um, in terms of personal loss of life and, and, you know, environmental damage. So that wraps up uh, section one of chapter two, the chemistry of life. And I hope that helps. Thanks.